Hey all, it's David Ducker coming back at you, and today we're going to be talking about architecture in RPGs. Not the architecture of RPGs, but architecture inside of them. The, the worlds your characters visit. What should they look like? What could they look like? Uh, so I'll start off uh, by talking about just some of the things we can learn from architecture. Because you can use the architecture as a storytelling tool, as exposition, without being overt about it. So uh, I'm going to bring in a bunch of real life examples here. Uh, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not an architect by any stretch of the imagination, but I know a little something, something about architecture, about historical uh, cityscapes. So let's start by uh, by contrasting two different architectural styles, and we'll see what each one of them uh, can teach us. So let's look at uh, let's look at a architectural style where all the people uh, have their houses. So you, you're looking down at the houses. Each house has a, has a bathroom and a kitchen and a bedroom. And uh, you know the, the, the main floor, which could be the living room or it could be the workshop if it's a mercantile home. Uh, so each house has all of these amenities. And then you go out into the street and there's row after row of houses. And uh, there's the, the big central marketplace, there's the big port, the big uh, city gates, there's a large palace, um, you know, and all, each uh, each house is going to also have its own shrine to like a household deity like Hestia, or perhaps an ancestral deity if we're talking about Shinto, but uh, that that's going to be our, our basic architectural style here. Uh, now let's contrast that, and we're going to look at a cityscape. Uh, which has all of the, the houses, and these houses uh, don't have bathrooms, they don't have kitchens, they don't have shrines, they just have bedrooms and then the, the workshop or the living space. But as you move out into the city, now you have a, a, a big grand temple instead of personal shrines. Uh, you, you have the marketplace, of course, you have the port, the gates, the, the palace, but you also have now public baths, um, and you, you have uh, you know, perhaps uh, public uh, fountains and wells instead of drawing water from a faucet inside your home. Uh, and you have uh, eateries, you have uh, restaurants and kitchens outside. Uh, and in addition to that, you have, uh, you have monuments, you have gardens, you have uh, you know obelisks and statues, you have amphitheaters and coliseums and the circus. Uh, so you have all of these things. So uh, let's let's now step back and we'll see these two cities next to each other. What what do they teach us? If we look at that first city, the people there are individuals. They're individual people. You know, I, I have my food, I have my gods, I have, I have my uh, bathing is private, very private and personal and, and separated, blocked off from from everyone else. Um, so you, you could interpret that as, as selfishness, even, to a degree. If it leans towards evil, that's selfishness. If it starts to come into uh, you know, the good uh, side, that's individuality, which is uh, what can be wonderful. But let's look at the other city now. So that's the individualist city. This other city is communal. The people eat together. They bathe together. They... Uh, they pray together. There's this, this community, a sense of community that binds them all. Uh, so they form this, this society. Uh, and not to say the other one isn't a society, it's just a different kind. So we look at this communal society and uh, we, we get this spirit decor, the, uh, the caring about your nation. So again, we can contrast. If that's good, they help each other, they support each other. If a man is sick, his neighbor will, will take care of him. But if we lean towards evil, that's, that can be you know, the worst parts of na nationalism. It could be fascism. It could be imperialism and uh, you know, conquest. Um, so these are, these are actually two real-life examples I've taken. Uh, Carthage was very individual in its uh, architecture, in its city layout. And their arch nemesis, Rome, uh, you may have heard of Rome, uh, they uh, they were very com communistic. Well, you know, they, they lived together. It was communal, is what I mean. Uh, and so, when one Roman city-state was in trouble, the neighbors would help them. 
and they 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 had this you know they were willing to sacrifice for the whole. Whereas in Carthage it wasn't like that, and when one Carthaginian city fell, no one cared. Nobody helped them. Uh, they 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 only cared about themselves. And, and a lot of historians would say that's you know one of the reasons that Rome beat Carthage and tore the city down. They completely dismantled it. So now we don't know much about Carthage. We know it was huge civilization, a powerhouse. It almost beat Rome. It came that close. Uh, but it lost. It, in the long run, it, it, it couldn't, uh, couldn't hang with Rome. And so we know very little of them, but from their cityscapes, uh, which is one thing that's very hard to destroy completely, uh, we, we've learned, we've inferred what I just told you about them, that they were individualistic. So that's an, an example of how the architecture in the city landscape can, can make a huge difference. Uh, you know, apply this to your fantasy cultures. Uh, do, are dwarves communal? Are, are elves uh, segregated? Um, which parts are segregated? Do they eat alone, but they pray together, or vice versa? Uh, you can do so many fun things to uh, play around these cityscapes. Do they have those big monuments, you know, like uh, Egypt had, like uh, like Ur had in Mesopotamia? Uh, or, or is it a fairly plain kind of cityscape, and they don't have statues or gardens? Or maybe they have gardens, but not statues. Or maybe they have fountains. And, uh, and each of these can lend its own meaning as well. You know, gardens can, can mean uh, that they're in tune with nature. I mean, building their houses really close together uh, can, uh, can, can again signify community. Uh, whereas a city that's spread out instead of built up uh, can be more individualistic. Or uh, it could be an economic choice, a religious choice. Uh, if you look at Washington DC, if you look at it on Google Maps, all the streets make really odd symbols. You know, some of the streets form a pentagram and some of the streets form a seven-pointed star. Uh, and there's a lot of conspiracy theories about why, you know, if they're, they're perhaps creating an elaborate magical circle, or perhaps the highway network of the USA is, is creating this elaborate magical uh, sigil um, for, for nefarious purposes. So, uh, and that's a great thing you could bring into architecture as well. Uh, if it, it's got some magical effect, uh, perhaps that the builders don't even know about. Um, so I, I think that's pretty much my whole ramble about architecture. Just that that's a really good example. You can, you can learn so much from it. Um, I, I could bring it back to, to Persepolis, and you could look at the, the Persians were originally nomads and steppe peoples. And when they started building cities uh, and houses, you know, they, they called them like stone tents, basically. And where, where their tents had the, the central pole or a central ring of poles, a circle of poles, um, their, their houses had a very similar design. They'd have a big pillar or a series of pillars, and they often had a, a one wall of their house open or one wall of their palace or temple. Um, you know, it's very mimicking tents. It's just a stone tent. So this tells you what the history of the people, what they care about. And, uh, you know, again, you can use uh, all kinds of great things like that in, in the architecture of a fantasy world, a sci-fi world. You know, how do, how do they build the, uh, the mega cities? You know, the Blade Runner city, the, the, the Coruscant from Star Wars. Uh, how are they each different? And what does that tell us about the people there and the cultures there? Uh, so that that is my ramble. I, I wanted to get Persepolis in because I'm a big fan of Persepolis, the the Hall of a Thousand Pillars. Um, but why don't you tell me in the comments below what have you done with architecture that was awesome and opulent and excellent? And uh, I'd love to read it. So I'm gonna sign out. I hope everybody has a good day in YouTube land. Cheers.